Bonsoir, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Jean-Jacques Pirat and I'm the director of the French Institute in Israel and the Councillor for Cooperation and Cultural Affairs. Welcome all of you to the third online lecture about AI. It's a great pleasure and it's also an honor to welcome our two very distinguished speakers. Both of them are the authors of a report advising their government to define a strategy in AI. Welcome Professor Cédric Villani and welcome Professor Isaac Ben Israel. In Israel, the government has decided to adopt an AI strategy which should be released soon. In France, in March 2018, Cédric Villani presented his report, AI for Humanity, a huge work all over the world with the hearing of about 400 experts and a survey of about 3,000 individuals. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Villani for his tremendous work to understand the development of AI and to establish new international cooperation. I had the great pleasure to work closely with Professor Villani on this topic when I was posted in Germany. Sure, Tonight, <laughs> Tonight, we are thrilled to know more about the Israeli strategy on AI and see if there are similarities and or complementarities and if we can start new cooperation. I would like to thank Martial Guerin, who has achieved an amazing job in organizing those debates. Finally, I wish you all a wonderful and inspiring evening. Paul, Paul Furia, scientific attaché, will, will be the moderator of this evening. Thank you, Paul. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Jean-Jacques. So, welcome and thank you for joining our, our series of conferences and uh, public debate panel discussion gathering Israeli and French experts to explore the world of artificial intelligence and answer your question. So this is uh, our third event and I'm happy to see you more and more participants. My name is Paul Furia, I'm the Deputy Director of the French Institute in Israel. I'm also the scientific and academic attaché at the French Embassy uh, in Tel Aviv. Today, we welcome two world experts on AI, Tarek Villani and Isaac Ben Israel. We will introduce and discuss French and Israeli strategies on artificial intelligence. I will say a few words about our two distinguished panelists, Cédric Villani. First, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, he's a mathemati mathematician. He was awarded with the prestigious 2010 Field Medals and the 2014 Dude Prize. He's a member of the French Parliament from 2017. He has always been involved in relations between sciences and society as a scientist, as a professor, as a parliamentary member or a member of the Academy of Science. On December 2017, uh, the French Prime Minister tasked Mr. Cédric Villani with a mission on artificial intelligence. His goal was to lay the foundation of an ambitious French strategy in the AI. And you can access his reports online, it's called AI for Humanity. Isaac Ben Israel, thank you very much also for joining, joining us. The head thank of you. the Malachnik Interdisciplinary Cyber Studies Center in Tel Aviv University, the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency and the Israel National Council for R&D. Uh, Isaac Ben Israel completed a prestigious career in the IDF, which led to his appointment as Director of Defense R&D Directorate in the Ministry of Defense. After retirement from the IDF, he joined the University of Tel Aviv. And you uh, briefly were the member of the Knesset between 2007 and 2009. In 2011, Mr. Ben Israel was instrumental in the drafting of Israel national cyber policy and the establishment of the National Cyber Authority. And recently, he was appointed again by the Prime Minister to lead the committee that formulated Israel artificial intelligence strategy in collaboration with Professor Evata Matania. I will uh, give the two uh, participants uh, the floor to present uh, for about 10 minutes the, the French and then the Israeli strategy. And then we'll have a 
short discussion between uh, between us, and uh, then afterwards we'll uh, close the before closing the event. We'll uh, give the floor to a question from the audience. So don't hesitate even during the presentation uh, to ask to send your question through the Q and A button on the on the back of the on the bottom of the screen, and I, I will pick them up uh, and ask them to the to the participants at the end. So, uh, Mr. Villani, the floor is yours, uh, and we are looking forward to it. Thank you very much for organizing this discussion. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you in this uh, through this meeting, and uh, uh, also talk to talk about AI, which is a subject that allows to lay out bridges between people, countries, and organizations. And uh, it's uh, always good to recall about artificial intelligence, which is a field that we all have heard about from a long time ago. I remember having first been exposed with the concept when I was in my teens. Uh, artificial intelligence in those days did not have the same flavor as today at all. It was mainly based on, the, on ideas of uh, logic and uh, rules, expert systems. There was the legacy of Turing was extremely strong in uh, questions such as what is the process of thinking. And there was this idea still around artificial intelligence, a way to reproduce human intelligence or to imitate it or to simulate it. This conception has changed quite fast over the past years. And now AI is not about systems being intelligent. It's about system being able to accomplish tasks. Tasks that you would have primarily naively believed to be reserved for humans. Tasks that may be complex, require a lot of parameters, require a lot of uh, error, try and error. And um, it has been very much driven by outputs rather than inputs. I mean, what is the output that you want to have? What is the data? What are the examples? Rather than asking about the cause. Ma ma more, more, much more nowadays driven by consequences and effects that you can observe than driven by the will to find the causes of phenomena. This is a kind of a revolution and uh, has been uh, crucial in the rising of efficiency of uh, methods. And let's make it clear that there is no good definition of AI. It's a set of techniques, it changes with the years. What is called AI now will not be called AI five years from now or 10 years from now and so on. There's always some subjectivity of what we call AI, but as it allows to go to, to new tasks, to perform new, new, new accomplishments, it's of course very much of interest for the industry, for the economy, because it uh, allows to make, to improve a lot of processes, to help some of them, to create new, new facts. And AI, a couple of decades ago, Governments did not care of it. Uh, budgets were ridiculously small. Now the budgets are in the billions. Governments are fighting to have the best strategy and so on. And it has become part, AI, it has become part of a global economical strategy of influence or war. And uh, there is the, the, uh, the issues of continental of international cooperation or competition have become extremely strong. What can we say about, um, uh, let's say, viewed from France, how do we see Israel? Israel is one of the great players of uh, AI and certainly over the, past, uh, over the past years has had more impetus in the field than, uh, than France. Israel has a very particular position as between somehow between Europe and USA and uh, at the time in which very much the issue is about how will Europe kind of stand up and find some unity to resist the uh, amazing strength, the uh, amazing 
uh, AI uh, forces that are in either the US or China, Israel has an extremely interesting role to play in this. And Israel is also the proof that you can have a good, uh, an interesting AI strategy and a lot uh, be on the international map without having huge, big, massive industries, as is the case in the US with their, with their huge giants. So it's another, it's a different model. I have been uh, led in my scientific career as a mathematician to visit Israeli institutions a number of times and given lectures and uh, got some prizes, in particular in Be'er Shiva, in Tel Aviv University or in Weizmann Institute. And also I've been there as part of my mission of AI. It was one of the countries that needed to be explored and, uh, and visited. And uh, some of my colleagues in, uh, in Technion, in Weizmann Institute, arranged for our visits. Some of the things that are extremely strong viewed from France is the uh, extreme ability of Israel for interdisciplinary cooperations. My, uh, one of my mathematicians colleagues who was telling me about the health uh, and AI strategy and our developments in Israel had a provoking thought for me. He was telling me, uh, you know, in France, you have an enormous school of mathematics monster, much bigger than the Israeli, with such a record over the years and so on. You also have an enormous school of health, which is much bigger than what we have in Israeli. But when it comes to the discussion between mathematics and health, you don't know how to do it. And we in Israel, we know how to do it. And I have to say, I've been sincerely uh, impressed seeing uh, some, of the, some of the research which has been doing in, uh, in Israel with people such as uh, Ran Baliser uh, and uh, research in Clarit Institute or many institutes and teams and the facility of doing things which are experimental, which are uh, multidisciplinary is very strong. That is, an, that is a very strong asset in a, in a field which does uh, favor interdisciplinarity. When I presented the French strategy in March 2008, I insisted on three keywords that we needed to implement. The first was experimentation because the subject has become extremely experimental, much more than what it used to be two decades ago. The second was sharing because it's very much about sharing experiences and meeting, interdisciplinary meeting and, uh, you know, computer specialist meeting a health specialist and discussing about uh, e-health e or expert in environment meeting experts in programming and discussing about how to have uh, systems that help the improvement, the, the environment being for reducing energy consumption or monitoring disease in the crops or whatever, you always need the association between the specialists and uh, of uh, the application and the people who develop the mathematics, the theory, the code, the algorithms. So this sharing is also very much about sharing data and the ability to leverage from the experience and experiments obtained from the many people involved in the field or in the, in the domain. And the third key word after experimentation and sharing was about the sovereignty. Sovereignty about deciding what use you want to be, how the human has to collaborate with the machine, how to find the right processes. Sovereignty also in geopolitical terms, how uh, will we manage to get the strategy and not being oppressed by the strategy that is currently being um, developed by economic interest. It's very striking to see that while research in AI is very much distributed over the planet with great experts in France, in UK, in Germany, in Israel, in Canada, in China, uh, economic, the, mass, the, the massive majority of economic investments and developments is either in the US or in China. And this is something one has to uh, be very careful about. Sovereignty is also in being able to uh, not being, not see the, our use dictated by, uh, by other. There has been a lot of developments, including recently during the COVID crisis. We'll have time in the discussions to go back to this. The French strategy where it's insisting on four sectors, is insisting on four sectors, defense, transport, health, and environment. Uh, environment is the one which has most difficulty to be launched, certainly because the culture of people 
involved in environment is very different from the technological culture of people involved in AI. And on the contrary, on the other side, health is the one in which it's most easy to have things started, or let's say, because we have all these uh, medical data issues that we can build from. Defense is a sector which has from many years uh, being used to being always at the top of the technology and uh, the, the development. So it's easy for that sector to see the, the stakes. We did not put finance in the list just because finance does not need the help of the nation to get uh, developed. It's very good in developing itself with its own means. Now, I have to say that among the, uh, in the, in the, the report, so there was a long list of measures and recommendations, you know, but I would say that the ones which were relying on institutional change have been well followed and developed by the government, like creating some institutes interdisciplinary in which research and uh, teaching and so on are taken in good, uh, at, at good level with some uh, added funding, etc., etc., or instituting an ethics committee to oversee the developments and give advice and so on. All this has been done. On the other hand, the changes which depend on culture and uh, personal initiative have had much more difficulty to uh, be, be achieved. And so like, like developing the, the teaching, increasing the number of students, encouraging companies to uh, use, to develop partnerships with uh, research teams rather than with big institutional giants and uh, all these, all the cultural changes, as we know, uh, always require more change. It's one of my favorite key quotations by Albert Einstein. It's more difficult to break an atom than to break um, a bad, uh, than to break a, a prejudice, you know, a bad idea that you would have to make a cultural change. So my friends, that's all for my presentation. I will go more into details uh, depending on the depending on the questions, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, give back the floor to our beloved moderator. Thank you very much, Professor Villani, for this uh, very interesting uh, summary of your huge work. Uh, Professor Ben Israel, we are very much looking forward to your presentation on yeah. the Valley strategy. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, actually, uh, in, in a way, we could skip my presentation because the first half of uh, Professor Villani's presentation was about the AI in Israel. And I must say, I fully agree with every word he said. So, in a way, but let me, let me try from the beginning. I'm happy. Uh, what uh, I was asked by the Prime Minister to do, this was June 18. June 18, two years ago, two, uh, one and a half year ago. What I was asked to do was to uh, repeat in a way something that I did for the government in 2010. But at that time, in 2010, it was about cyber technology. And then I was asked to give to the government uh, a strategy and a five-year plan how to make Israel one of the top five countries in the world in, in cyber technology. It's more or less the same task I, I got now, but this time about AI. And if I, uh, I uh, will read from the uh, letter of appointment in which already the vision and the objective is, is dictated in a way. So the vision is empowering Israel as a scientific technological power from the perspective of national economy and security. Two, two very general uh, goals. And ensuring the future and national strengths of Israel, of the state of Israel, as a secure, open, democratic, and knowledge-based society. And the objective is even simpler, to position Israel at the top five countries of the world in the core technological fields which serve uh, this vision within the next five years. Now, one immediately, I mean, when I, when I tell everyone that this is the goal, one immediately asks me, how can you compete with China or the United States of America or Europe as a whole? 
uh, these are giants and we are not exactly, uh, uh, cannot compete them in, in this way. And the same question was asked uh, 10 years ago when we started what nowadays we call the cyber revolution in Israel. At 2010, with the cyber, it was easier in a way because although we have not invented cyber technology, this was 2010, we, it was already used for 30 years or so by certain countries. France, France is one of them, by the way. When I did this work in 2010, uh, one of the three, four countries that I visited was France. Uh, uh, but what we had then an advantage because we, we were the first in the world to, in a way, to take it out of the closet, to, to transfer cyber technology from secret uh, uh, profession done by intelligence and defense uh, services and to transfer it into an open uh, civilian commercial uh, uh, occupation, uh, it is not the case in AI. AI, everyone knows that AI is the, one of the basic pillars of uh, future technology and everyone is running very fast and we have a, a much greater problem. Now, Professor um, uh, Villani was very right in saying that we have one advantage, and this is that we are smaller than the others. I, I would like to, uh, to explain. I mean, in a big country like the US or China, there is not, not even possible to think about, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you when the Prime Minister called me and, and, and we discussed the AI, and he asked me, whom should I consult uh, in order to uh, decide about this project? And, uh, and the next uh, three days afterwards, we were something like 40, 50 people in a room with the prime minister, all the experts from the three main elements of the society, that is academy, government, and industry, speaking very generally. This can be done almost only in Israel because we are small enough and we are connected to each other. And this is what we used when we uh, uh, submitted the, the plan 10 years ago about cybersecurity, we are using it now as well. Um, um, the, the, at the end of the day, you have three different elements like in any other things and you have to if you want to change the life, I mean, you want really a revolution in, in Israel, you need that all these three, three elements will cooperate. Uh, Professor Villani uh, uh, mentioned the problem of sharing information. It's very easy to talk about it. It's very difficult to overcome the psychological and different interest uh, obstacle. It's not, it's not about technology, almost not about technology, although there are some technologies that can help us, like uh, uh, the, the, the ability to cross different data sets without the need to code different, uh, uh, encrypted different data sets without the need to decrypt the, the information and things like this. Even though it's very difficult, we have to overcome human problems. It's not, these are more difficult than technology. Still, uh, because we are a small country, we know each other, we believe that like we did in cyber, and today Israeli, Israeli export of, of cyber um, uh, uh, products and, and, and uh, knowledge and IP is something like 10% of the overall market, global market, global market. Uh, we believe we, we can do the same with AI. Now, what, what is our strategy? Uh, we, we divided the work into three different axes, independent axes. In the first one of them is, we call it the technological access, uh, axis, and we asked ourselves, what, what do you mean by, by AI? This was also mentioned by Professor Villani. Uh, usually when people say AI, they mean something related to machine learning, uh, neural networks, uh, uh, also today it's popular to say because we have um, uh, huge data sets, so you need something, uh, we call it data science today, it was called data analysis maybe a year ago or statistics when I was uh, still a student. Um, uh, how do you take a lot of um, data and, and subtract from it some, 
significant uh, uh, um, uh, lessons. But when we decided that this is not enough, a very simple example, uh, uh, AI is on the table for almost 70 years. I mean, since the beginning of the 50s, it was already put uh, on paper by visionaries like Turing or Minsky in the States, etc. And the reason it's only now uh, becoming, it's start to, to, to flourish and becoming what, what, whatever it is today is only or almost only because of a huge growth in, in computer power. I mean, in order to, to, uh, uh, in order to uh, use this AI algorithm, you need a, a, a lot of computation, huge matrices that you have to, to deal with. And for this, you need a uh, uh, certain power of computation, which was not available 20 or 30 years ago, unless you were a, a superpower like the US with some supercomputer, but not available to the whole community. And, and therefore, the way we see it, one of the technologies needed in order to make a revolution, we want a very comprehensive revolution to be done in Israel. Uh, one of the technologies should be power of computation, that is the classical, what we call supercomputers or, or the cloud or, or uh, GPA uh, accelerators or, or the next step should be also a quantum computing, which is not yet here, but we, we start to see the beginning of it, okay? And, and, and therefore, uh, we, uh, we took, uh, in every axis, we had some, uh, uh, something like five or so different subcommittees. Each one of them was composed of experts of this technology. One of them for, uh, one, one subcommittee who was for uh, computer power, the other one for machine learning and data science, another one for IoT, because once you train a machine to do some AI work, there's no reason why the machine will stop learning once it's already uh, doing its job. The only thing you have to, to do is to connect it to some sensor and to feed it back with uh, some information in order to enable it to learn from its experience. But the, uh, let's say there is some, some uh, system in airport or so that helps us in identifying the uh, suspected behavior of terrorists, I can, uh, uh, I can connect it to all the tens of thousands of cameras all over the country and, and, and enable it to learn from other cameras in the system if I will have some way to connect all these sensors in uh, what we call Internet of Things. And, and suddenly IoT and Internet of Things uh, if you look at it from this perspective, becomes also one of the technologies relevant for AI. Uh, and there are also other technologies, uh, of course, robotics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, the whole project in Israel is not called, at the beginning, we called it the, the Artificial Intelligence Initiative, National Artificial Intelligence Initiative. Now we prefer the name, uh, um, the National secured artificial intelligence. And, and because one has to remember that in a very general sense, what we are doing by using AI, we let the machines in certain areas take decisions instead of human beings. And therefore, uh, it, we, we, we create by this some weak ones and some bad guys may use the same, I mean, use this, uh, 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 um, network, not in order to, uh, for the benefit of, of society, health, etc., cetera, uh, like we did, uh, I mean, we built it for this, but for their own benefit, and therefore it should be from the beginning, uh, you should think about uh, how to secure this uh, system. Now, this is one axis, technology. The second axis is about applications, about uh, uh, use cases. And we chose uh, five different uh, areas in life. The first one is, of course, healthcare and health, because there is a lot one can do if, if you can uh, uh, cross uh, data sets, let's say clinical and, and, and genetical, et cetera. You can use a lot uh, by machines, I mean. 
you can uh, uh, learn a lot about uh, health. Uh, the second one was trans transportation, by the way, more or less the same list that uh, Professor Villani just described, transportation. Unlike you, we had also financial system, but we decided to take it out of the list because of the same reason that, that uh, you get. Uh, 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 we don't need to help, to help them there, they, they do whatever can be done by themselves. Uh, we added also agriculture, which in Israel is, is by, by the way, agriculture is very, uh, very close to uh, life sciences, uh, to, to human, uh, but without all the problems of, of uh, sensitivity, privacy, and things like this. These are creatures that don't sue and don't complain, the, the, veg the vegetation, the plants. Uh, and of course, uh, defense or security, which, which in Israel is always very important. And in each one of these areas, we had, uh, we defined a, a, a leading project, which uh, is a practical project uh, that will have results in two or three years, because we have to show that all those who finance it at the end of the day, that this is not only about pure uh, uh, science, but it has some practical results that will um, help the society in Israel in all those uh, different things. The most difficult one was the third axis. The third axis is the cross-section axis. Uh, we call it government. Now, uh, in Israel, when we say government, we mean also the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, because part, this is part of the machine that, that um, uh, um, you know, we, we, many times we think about uh, new ideas as emerging from basic science, from academy, and then you have to find a way how to translate it, how to, to um, uh, transfer the technology from the academy to real life in economy or defense. Many times uh, defense is one step ahead, and, and uh, you have to think about the uh, to, about reversing the flow, and it's very sensitive and problematic, and if you don't think about it from the beginning, it will uh, never work. Um, uh, by the way, we, we learned it some 70 years, uh, 60 years ago from, from France, in other issues, of, I mean, there, at that time there was, computers were very rare machines, um, but, but you have to think about it. Problems of regulation, I mean, without regulation, it can be anarchy. If regulation is too restrictive, it can kill any emerging idea. Uh, for each one of these, again, we had a committee of experts uh, defining uh, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, which is as important as what we should do. Uh, education, I mean, the basic, the, the, the most important element of all the elements uh, is about, is, is the educational element. Um, uh, in cybersecurity, we, as I told you, we use the same, 10 years ago, we use the same methodology. At, the, at that time, 2010, by the way, it's, it's very difficult to imagine it today. But 2010, there was not even one university in the world, neither in Israel nor in France, nor in any other country in the world, in which you could go and get the, a degree in cyber uh, security. Today, you find a lot of them, and this was only 10 years ago. Uh, one of our recommendations then, in 2010, was that every university in Israel uh, will have a research, cyber research center. Uh, I, I'm heading the Tel Aviv Cyber Research Center, which has something like 250 researchers. It's, it's, cool. it's, it's big even in, in French terms, not only in Israeli term, 250 researchers, but there is one in every university. This is only uh, perhaps the biggest one, but, but there are also uh, centers like this in other universities. We teach, we, I think we are the only country in the world, we teach cybersecurity in high school. And, and of course, we, we, we would like to repeat the same exercise with AI. We would like to, we still have this system, all German systems that we copied some 70 years ago of matriculation examinations at the end of, of high school. 
uh, we, some of the subjects are obligatory. Some of them you can choose from, the student can choose from a certain short list. We added 10 years ago to this list cybersecurity. We are going to add uh, now AI as well. So people will grow with the awareness and there will not be AI experts, of course, like, like anyone who studied mathematics in, in, in school is not a mathematician really, but they will have the, uh, uh, some understanding of what it is about. Uh, uh, we we um, uh, came with a lot of recommendations of how, I mean, all these elements, industry, startups, uh, uh, government, uh, uh, defense, all these elements should work together. How to encourage them to do this? I mean, uh, the government cannot really tell them, you do this, because if it is against their interest and if they will not gain something out of this cooperation, it will never happen. So we came with a lot of small recommendations that will uh, 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 give any element here something back if he will cooperate with the other, if he will feed the other elements, he will get also something from them. Um, uh, the same way we did uh, with cybersecurity. Um, I, will, I, I got only 10 minutes and I think I, I finished them. So I hope I will hear your uh, questions because there's some technical problem here, but I just know this. Thank you very much. Professor Ben Israel, we, we, we heard you perfectly. Hello. Um, I, sorry, I... You need your phone? Yeah. Can yeah. You no, sorry. Okay. So, thank you very much, Professor Ben Israel. We, we heard you perfectly. Um, just before I, I have, of course, a few questions I, I would like to, to ask you, uh, but before I, I jump, jump in, is there either Professor Villani or Professor Ben Israel? Is there a, a question that uh, you would like to ask to the to the other participant after listening to uh, his presentation? Professor Villani, I, I saw you you nodded a few times, or you mean uh, asking questions to each other? Yes. By the way, I don't know if the participants have access to the chat. Maybe some of the or maybe uh, not. They do, they do have access to the chat. They do have access, also, so they give you some questions. To, to so questions. They can leave them on the q and Just rather than questions, I have some comments, which are, so, uh, I cannot, uh, first, I cannot insist uh, too much on the very important thing that Professor Ben Israel said about sharing of data. Most, in the huge majority of cases, the problem in sharing data is not a technical problem, it's a trust problem. You have these people even working in the same company who will not share their data from one corridor to the other corridor. And we are asking people to share data between organizations or even between countries for it to work. So it's very difficult. That is by far the most tricky. And you know, uh, data, is an issue of trust <laughs> and it's an issue of culture and it's an issue of uh, learning to, to work uh, together. I remember an illuminating conversation with uh, somebody who had been responsible of setting up a platform system in a hospital and he was summarizing and saying, when you set up a system of data information system, there are three challenges that you need to, to overcome. The first is the technical challenge which say specification, which format, which algorithm, uh, which uh, hardware, etc. The second is the legal and ethical challenge. Do I have right to get this? Is there some uh, ethnical data or whatever? What am I allowed to do, to collect and to do? And the third is the issue of the human organization, the trust. Who will talk to whom? Who will decide that the data is there? Who will have access to the data? It's a purely human problem, and that in practice is often the most difficult to solve. And uh, we, in general, have a tendency to, to uh, over, you know, think, uh, to, to overstate the technical problem, which is never that difficult in the end, and to understate the human problem, which is often more than, uh, more than, uh, more often than not, the, the most difficult problem. 
And the other thing I wanted to second comment, why is health so well adapted to, to AI? First, because it's all with there are the data and depends on a lot of parameters. So you can cross, try to find some key things. It does the combination of this pathology and this medicine or this feature, etc., give rise to something? And second is because in health, we never know the causes. You know, when your car does not work, you can identify when the problem. But when you have a disease, there are so many problem causes. People can fight for decades about what is the cause of this and that, even for such so, some very uh, classical disease, we still don't know. And AI is very good when you are unable to identify the causes because it doesn't care of causes. It cares about correlations, it cares about, co cares about consequences, it cares about action. So that's a field in which you can have a lot of added value. And my third comment is about education. Such important for all. You know, I've been a teacher all my life uh, and uh, transmission is so important. Also, I have, I, I have this theory that you never understand something really before you have taught it. So you need to teach to, uh, to understand things. And teaching uh, AI, teaching computer science in school is so very important. We are lagging behind for this in France and I'm having conversations with this regularly, including with the French Minister of Education, it was a few days ago, and agreeing, and, and you know, uh, we are not a small country. <laughs> wow. It's a country that is such a burden to handle national education in France is a terribly complicated thing. When you need to change it someplace, you have to change everything. So it's also difficult, but it's very important that we set up some education system that is very good and uh, in terms of uh, uh, computer science. And that means being able to have notions of programming and coding initiation from a very early age. No kids, six years old, they can start their initiation uh, uh, about this. And that means also late, late uh, after improving, uh, uh, in the, uh, the same time as you are taught some notions about society, philosophy, and so on, which are the main, pr being taught, which are the main principles the of the algorithms on which the world relies. You know, the world has changed in the past two decades enormously, and I think every student, every kid nowadays getting out of high school should have a notion of how does the Google algorithm work? What is the main principle? what is the main principle on which an automatic translation machine works and not be just a passive user of technology, seeing the technology as uh, magic, you know. We need to form citizens which are used to ask questions to be able to see behind the, the shadows and understand the main principles, some of the main uh, abstract phenomena which are part of the forces shaping the world today. If I may, one comment, a short one. Uh, but, I mean, there is a lot of agreement uh, between us on these issues. I would generalize it and say that uh, people who deal with science and technology many times forget that human nature is one of the most powerful forces of nature. And, and we have to, to take it into account seriously. I, you, um, so I, I'll jump in and you both presented the, 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 the main uh, aspect of both strategies. And as you, as you said, there are more similarity than discrepancy. And it's, uh, it's not so surprising because uh, we're both trying to tackle the same, the same issues, right? Uh, though, uh, you maybe there there are things where uh, approaches are different from uh, in in France or in Israel. You didn't speak about, for instance, how to finance such an effort to develop uh, technologies and so on. And what's the role of the the public of the government or the state in this in this endeavor? COVID, you said. Does the state has to play a particular role in the financing, for instance, or sh who should finance all of these endeavors? 
okay, if I, I may say, I mean, the, the government, uh, government shouldn't play a role of uh, finance. Government has to, to invest a lot of money, by the way, in, in, uh, in Israeli terms, it's a lot, a lot of money. Our, our plan um, uh, is about uh, some 10 billion shekels. It's, it's big money, but not in developing AI technology, only in enabling it in, in what we call the capabilities builder. That is investing in high schools, education, in university research center, investing in industry, in terms of letting them, uh, encouraging them to, we have a very high, high developed, high tech ecosystem in Israel. You have to invest certain uh, uh, money in order to take this ecosystem and to shift it a little bit towards AI. It's not building it from zero and not uh, 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 investing in, in, in the development R&D itself by itself on LinkedIn. You have to, for example, give you something very banal problem. Uh, it was mentioned by Professor Villanil that one of the things that we would like to have is to, to double or triple even more the number of students that will be graduated of AI uh, um, uh, algorithms or technology, depends what faculty. How do you do this? For this, you need to double more or less the number of, uh, of professors. But those professors are kidnapped in a way by the big industries. We can, uh, we, were, we, we had the, the advice to ignore them, but in this sense, you cannot ignore them. I mean, when a professor comes to me and say, I, I will leave the center because I got an offer from Facebook, I don't even ask him how much because I know I cannot compete. I can, we, a university cannot compete with, with uh, and, but we have to solve this problem. We have to change the very classical 1,000 years old uh, 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 tradition of what is a professor, what a professor can do, what he cannot do, what, what we should allow them to do, and not stick to the old uh, 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 habits that will not work with such a very fast developing area. Uh, as a small example, but you have to think about this very, uh, very small, uh, sensitive elements. Otherwise, you will not have a coherent ecosystem. And the whole idea of Israel as a small country would like to compete the giants is to have a coherent system, which is easier to be done in small countries than in big ones. Do you... Yes, very interesting. Of course, this issue of the economic model, who pays, is crucial. And uh, in France, the tradition is state does everything. Uh, we don't have uh, a good tradition of cooperation between the state and the private sector. And that's one of the big issues we need to solve. It used to be worse. Things are improving. But it still has to, to, to go a, a long way. Um, and uh, when it goes for training, when it goes to our university action on our universities and so on, the issues described by Professor Ben Israel, we have just the same with our professors, uh, teachers, researchers being uh, absorbed by the, the, the giants with huge salaries and also huge facilities. I mean, uh, their positions come with enormous computing capacities, help, uh, whatever technology they need to have, which is, uh, which is very important for them. And that, that needs to be, to be resolved. We cannot uh, go it in frontal war against, the, against the, the industry and these interests. It would be, you would be sure to, to lose in advance. Uh, when it goes to research, you have to organize so that there is a good uh, go back and forth and cooperation. I, I see some of the, um, I see some questions in the chat. Let me make some comments on the questions that I see. Yeah. One of the questions is how does intellectual property law encourage the development of artificial intelligence? In my experience, it's not such, a, such an issue about uh, intellectual property and artificial intelligence. 
in the sense that these algorithms are always kind of fuzzy with definitions which are which are rather loose. If you put, of course, there will be uh, a lot of uh, IP uh, development and so on in there. Uh, there is a danger that uh, IP uh, is, uh, you know, makes it slower rather than uh, rather than than faster. This is a domain in which you need to keep the flexibility, community that people can go. Uh, make the experiments, collaborate with each other, and so on. You know, issues such as uh, open source and whatever go well with philosophy of, uh, of artificial intelligence. And uh, I, I hope there's not too much IP that goes in this. Of course, IP in those days is everywhere, but still. There are some questions that I see here about should national AI initiatives take into account values such as democracy, equality and justice the answer is very clear whatever ai project you have is a society project think of ai as just a mean to achieve something whatever goal you have you should assess it as a goal for the society with the values that you have and that you want to share and forget about the fact that it's used with one technique or another there has been enormous gossip and discussions and uh, uh, about what is the specific ethics of AI and what happens in the trolley problem if the autonomous car will have to run over that pedestrian or those pedestrians and so on. All that is a distraction from the real issues, which is what do we want our tools to, to do? If it's about finding a good tool to allocate empty apartments to people who are in need of apartments, you need to ask which are the values that you want to put in the choice what values of fairness, of uh, equity, etc., And uh, forget that it's an AI tool and ask when you have it and maybe test whether the tool that you have does take into it the good, the good values. And so that's also one reason because we know values depend on culture. It's also a reason to tackle the development of your tools. And in that respect, the, the values in uh, US society are in some respect the same, but in some respect very much different also from those that you can find in Europe. There is a... Uh, Sorry, uh, Professor Ben Israel, do you also uh, want to react on the two, uh, two points on IP and does the IP uh, regulation encourage or, or, or is an obstacle to development of AI and about the values? You, you ask me? Yes, pro Professor, do you also want to comment and, and answer to the question about IP and... Uh, well, uh, the, the, as I, I, I referred to it before, but, but I agree with uh, Professor Villani. I mean, uh, values is something which is very important. Now, when machines decide something, Many times we don't, uh, we, we cannot even explain why the machine uh, took this decision or that decision. We know the algorithm, so we assume that the data was leading it to, to this uh, result and not to that result. But with, uh, many times it's not explainable. Now, the, the problem is, we, when we speak about AI today, we speak about uh, training the machine how to digest the data and what to do with it, and then to recognize certain patterns, et cetera, et cetera. We don't educate the machine. We don't, uh, and, uh, at least until now, okay? We don't uh, tell the machine, this uh, you shouldn't do. It, not because it's, it's uh, uh, not supported by the data. This the machine will, will understand by itself. If the word understanding is, is right here. But, but, we don't educate them and say uh, um, this uh, uh, decision is not ethical. Don't do it. Don't tell whatever you think about because certain things shouldn't be said and things like this. Like we do this, uh, the same problem we have with our own kids. Those kids are also some artif uh, not artificial or perhaps natural, but natural intelligent machines. Okay, not uh, artificial. 
and, and, and we teach them not only how to deal with data and what to, to decide and how to behave in this world, but also what values, what shouldn't be done, what, what is important, etc. And, and, and this we still have to, um, to uh, introduce into this um, whole AI huge uh, uh, global effort. We have to think about educating, or I'm speaking about the values of, the, of those machines. Uh, we are not there yet, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we will not have any other uh, choice. I mean, same thing we do with our kids. You, thank you. You both use uh, almost the same word during your presentation. Professor Villani, you spoke about how sovereignty is important, and Professor Ben Israel, you spoke about regulation. Uh, we all understand uh, there are threats. I mean, AI can both be uh, an, uh, beneficial, but it can be also a threat to our society. There is a key, also a key question uh, you didn't mention, but I know it's in both strategy. It's about public acceptance and how uh, uh, how the public will react to uh, development on on AI applications. On this aspect, there is a there is a, a quite debate, uh, academic and also political debate of the role of government in this uh, regulatory effort. Who should Put the limits. Who should decide? Uh, it should also be at, at the international level. So, what's your what your um, your view on this? Uh, the model that we decided on in France, which was a consequence of my report, is the model of a, uh, an ethics committee, independent, maybe two dozen people or something like this. Uh, on the same model as we have uh, an ethics committee for issues related to human health and things like organ transplants and uh, vaccination and whatever, we have this ethics committee for digital use, which says about what is or not. For instance, when we have the, all the fuss about the, the stop COVID application and uh, whether it's ethical to have these uh, possibility of detecting who has been in contact with whom and who should be tested in terms of times of COVID. The, the, this kind of application was analyzed by our committee to decide whether it was uh, ethical or not, etc. I think it's, um, you should not let the uh, government decide what is ethical. It's uh, good to have an independent committee for that of people who are nominated according to their experience and to their values and the mix of, uh, of that. Let me insist, uh, and I will make the link to another question that I see. This is about our actions. And when we think about ethics of AI, we all think about what decision is good and make sure that, for instance, our algorithm is not a racist algorithm. And there have been examples very well documented of racist algorithms, which were not racist because they were told to be racist, but which were racist because they were calibrated on data coming from a use of the society, which had some racist bias, even though it was not, uh, not conscious. Now, nowadays, when we think of the ethics, there's a the human ethics, there's also the environmental ethics. We should have these algorithms which are uh, are not uh, harmful to the to the to the land to the earth to the to the biosphere and this here is touching upon one of the most serious questions that now the tech in general has to address has to regulate its environment in print uh, one of the i see in the chat uh, of questions and uh, other people can see the question of bertrand barnsheik about the enormous exponential increase of the power which is used for computing by algorithms worldwide and which is growing monthly. Some of it renewable, some of, which, some of it not at all. And the trajectory which very clearly is not sustainable for the world. That is for the power, but that is also for the rare earth, for the hardware, 
currently, we change our smartphone on which we do all these beautiful artificial intelligence apps and whatever. Each of us, each user in our societies change it, say, every two or three years. It should be 20 years before it to be environmentally sustainable. What do we do now? Will someday the individual smartphone be something that only very rich people can afford because real prices will be, will be there? Or will it just be impossible because we have run out of, um, of material and, uh, and the earth of it? Copper is supposed to be one of the materials that will uh, go through shortage in the near future. All these questions just say five years ago were not really in the scope. And all the problem for uh, a cyber field was to grow bigger, faster, bigger memories and faster and so on. And it was, uh, uh, and we used to say, you know, it's beautiful, no more paper waste. Now we do it in a dematerialized way and so on. But now the physics has caught up with us. And we see that behind all this, there is enormous use of, uh, of energy, enormous use of material resources in a way that we have as a, as a generation, as a society, the duty to make sustainable. And that will not be easy. Professor Ben Israel, what's your opinion on those two questions, governmental control and the sustainability, the sustainability sorry, of the, the current path, AI? Well, I'm not a big fan of control in almost in anything, okay? Although there should be some control, otherwise there will be an anarchy in any field, but it should be always the minimal amount of control. Uh, uh, I would, for, if we speak, for example, about uh, ethics, etc., in AI, I wouldn't uh, uh, um, recommend about a certain set of rules. This you should do, this you shouldn't do, etc. But more a, a, a kind of a checklist. I mean, these points you have to uh, to to think about. You, the, the developer, the researcher, the the industry producer, the, everyone. You, this are uh, this is the checklist. You please look at it and and ask yourself if you answered all these. Uh, possible uh, problems that may arise. But not saying this is allowed, this is not allowed. Uh, if we will do this, we will not be able to develop any really significant new technology. Uh, about the system, uh, well, the, the, the last question is more philosophical in a way, okay? So the way I see it, I mean, some people are religious and they think that there is a, a difference between machines and human beings or biological beings. But the way I see it is we are also machines. Very sophisticated one. I mean, the, the, the Turing machines that we use today, the computers, are not even close to with their capabilities to what uh, we can do with this machine here, the brain. But the brain is a, is a very sophisticated, huge machine. And the same problems uh, that people uh, rise now about the machines, they first should ask themselves about human beings. Okay, I was a year ago before the before the corona. I was in Japan in a, speaking about AI, and there was a very old ex general, Soviet general, who was in charge. He was a, a commander of this uh, post. That at the end of the day will push the, the red button for nuclear. Uh, and, and he said there that he is afraid that one day uh, uh, when AI technology will be uh, reliable enough, uh, trusted, etc. So no, it's not the case today, but one day uh, he will be replaced by, by machine, by intelligent machine that will decide to push the red button or not to push the red button. And he's not sleeping at nights because of this. And I asked him uh, if he was there 24 hours uh, a day, every day, 365 days a year. He said, no, I had to go to sleep, I had to go to rest. What happened when you were not there? My deputy was sitting there. Did you trust this deputy? How, do, how can you trust another man that you don't know what is going in his mind? 
we learn to trust people. We, sh we will learn, this is my, my uh, more philosophical view, we will learn slowly, it will not be uh, very fast, to trust also uh, intelligent machines that are doing, and, and then it will be sustainable. I mean, I don't see why not. By, by the terms of computing power, once we will have these uh, quantum computing computers, which we are all work on it, it will be, a, a, a quantum computer should be something at the order of magnitude of 10 to the order of 30 more powerful than, than this machine, the, the human computer, the brain. And in, in terms of this, it, they will be much more uh, uh, capable than we are. Thank you very much. We'll now, uh, I, I now uh, take uh, the question uh, that uh, have been asked. Uh, some already have been uh, answered. There are questions about uh, health and the uh, role of uh, AI in the current uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, one question is about uh, to what extent AI can anticipate uh, future pandemia. And uh, the, the other question is uh, a little bit more pessimistic. Uh, uh, though, although there, there are a lot of uh, expectation from AI, it doesn't seem to play a big role in the current crisis and that doesn't help to solve the, the problem. What's your view on those two uh, aspects? Professor Benisa. Uh, okay. Uh, I wish we would use our human intelligence to cope with, with the corona. Unfortunately, this is not the case in certain countries, including our uh, and for this, you don't need AI. It's true that AI is not mature enough. I mean, this AI bec is becoming only now mature. Only in the last few years, it's becoming mature. And what if you don't work and train the machines before something happens on similar sets of data, then it will not help you. And, 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 um, uh, but unfortunately, we, ha uh, we are not using our natural AI, and you look what is happening in the world. Natural it's AI. unbelievable. I mean, people are, are, are acting, I mean governments, okay, when I say. Governments are acting uh, using their common sense, perhaps, and, and uh, doing things that have no, no proof that are helping something. No proof, but no one is even looking for proofs. See, people are acting based on common sense. For example, they say you should block all the people in the in, in dead houses. Don't they imagine as if a, a locked one is 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 locked in a in a, in a cell without any any um, a, a, a connection with the external world, which can never be done can never be done. So the, what, whatever the machines will do, whatever the machines will do, uh, uh, we are, we human beings are training them. In the best case, they will uh, train to be, to think the same way we think, with all our problems, with all our biases, with all our uh, um, uh, sometimes, what we call common sense rules, which are not rules at all and, and are not uh, wise at all. Yes, so I also put some of the, some, some uh, typed a little bit of elements of answers. For the, for the COVID, uh, first, anticipating diseases and so on is a, is a nightmare. The only thing you can do is try to see some, uh, you know, in the exchange of information, some uh, uh, hidden information from the whole uh, body of communication and so on, you know, data mining about finding some uh, weak signals uh, and so on. But there's no way you can use the AI to predict there will be 
another more wave the next year or the year after or whatever. Uh, you remember, AI relies on mainly on uh, good sets of data, of examples, such for rare events, by definition, it's a, it's a tool that is uh, rather poor. Now, uh, now, for this COVID crisis, it was so sudden and all our health systems were completely overloaded and data uh, transmission and recollection in health is a slow process. You have to put it in a good format. In our, in our French system, the, which is much slower than the Israeli system in that respect as we compared, uh, data, health data coming from hospitals are put together and harmonized and well compiled on, uh, let's say, a three months or six months process. Maybe by pushing all actors and so on, you can have a one month process. But there it would have been a, a one day or one week process that was needed. It's just uh, currently not possible. Maybe at the scale of just one hospital, they could have done something better, but in practice, in hospitals, they were completely flooded with tasks to do, uh, ill people to handle, so they had no time to perform their uh, experiments on AI, and no precise question, you know, why, like what is the, the first thing in every research work is, what is the question? Or you can run your things and see, can we find something that is unusual, as we always do, often do in research, but that requires some, some good time to think, uh, to think about. Uh, the remark about the human uh, intelligence is very important. I remember a discussion with the head of um, um, a research institute in health, a German institute, big institute, and, uh, I, and I, uh, it was at the time of the development of these uh, automated uh, tools on the smartphone to, to, to see people who should be tested and so on. He was one of the people in charge. He was very much worried about the complexity of developing this and so on. But when I asked him, what does worry make you most worry currently related to this pandemic? And he asked me the fake news and the rumors and the fact that people are starting to think irrationally that I am starting to meet people on the street who believe that it's all this COVID is due to uh, is due to Bill Gates uh, wanting to control the mankind or things like this. And it's amazing the ability of humans to incorporate uh, things that are absurd or theories or whatever complot that you, 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 you may think of. But apart from that, reactions that are too fast, reactions that are too emotional in this have overcome every, uh, a lot of uh, sensible actions that they were to do. There is, as you said, there is a lot of fear and, uh, and comprehension uh, and the, the question of threat is also uh, asked by, by several people. We have a few questions about the, the threat. Um, for instance, uh, how would AI will, uh, will transform and change the warfare in the future? We uh, established law of war, can we uh, have this same law or regulation applied to uh, uh, AI driven weapons? Uh, there is also questions about uh, nuclear power. Uh, Professor Ben Israel mentioned the topic, it's, it, it comes up often regularly. Uh, nowadays we have basically humans in charge of uh, deciding whether or not uh, using nuclear weapons. And in, uh, even in, in democratic states, as in the US or in France, it's a, a single individual who is actually in charge of deciding. Uh, is it more rational or more risky to have an AI, or less risky having an AI to decide these kind of things? Uh, what's your... Uh, Professor Binsrael, you already slightly touched the, the subject. Do you want to add uh, something else? No, I, I'm, I'm not so worried as most of the people I know about this uh, issue. Because no one is going to let any machine, 
AI or simple machine. Take decisions if it will not be after a long time in which it will have to prove that it works properly and uh, as reliable as human beings. I mean, for example, every one of us are, are using, uh, are, are flying with uh, uh, commercial uh, flights all over the world. Most of the flight is done by computers. I mean, the pilot is there only in case there is some uh, problem, most of the flight. And, and, and sometimes even there is a problem and it tries to uh, take manual control and change it, there were cases like this, the computer doesn't let him even do it, okay? But we still fly, no, not worrying too much because the accidents are very rare, the systems are very reliable, etc. And it took, took years. In military, uh, those uh, automatic uh, pilots, etc., etc., were used years before they were used for commercial uh, transport because uh, uh, military very naturally will take more risks than, than civilian commercial society. But in, if you speak about the normal duties in life, the normal missions and goals in life, no one will use it before it will prove to be reliable enough. Like in any technology, technology is really uh, neutral in a way. Okay? You, you, you can use it in a good way, in a bad way. It's not the technology by itself that affects our life. Vilani, do you have a, a thought on this big issue? Uh, the weapons and, and automatization. Yes. Uh, let me say uh, that this, when we were working on that report, it is the only issue on which my, the committee, you know, the, the team of people working with me, did split apart with people uh, being angry and uh, two dissenting uh, opinions uh, being there. It's a very, very tricky issue. We, I believe that first, you never as a human should hide the, the responsibility and say responsibility is with the machine. It's your duty to keep the responsibility to the, to the human. Then, it's a subject in which if you don't, and Professor Ben Israeli did go a little bit into what it is in practice this, if you don't go into in practice what task it is, you cannot do the, the discussion. It makes no sense. There is no good definition of an AI weapon. There is even no good definition of an automated weapon. What does it mean? According to some definitions, if you put a mind that will blow up when uh, tragically somebody, uh, somebody walks there, this may be an intelligent weapon, you know, because it will blow up exactly only when there is somebody there. And uh, sending a missile, if you send a missile, there are always some correcting mechanisms or whatever. So there is always some dose of AI to some extent here and there. You really need to, to see, to tell what are the, the actions which you believe are possible or not, who takes the decision, who is responsible, and if you don't ask these, uh, these questions, uh, you get nowhere. It's not an issue of AI or, or not AI. Um, let's say also that this will probably be a big issue in the coming, uh, in the coming decades. Already we see when there are the, the drone wars here and there, these are big issues about what is tolerable as, a, as, a, as an activity, as a war activity or not. Um, of course, the issues of uh, uh, what we tolerate in a society in terms of face recognition and so on are key and extremely emotional. And um, we, 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 we will, it's, it's a story that needs to evolve. Uh, very often, Regulation is about putting obstacles to our own limits, and when some things become too efficient, you need to put some, you need to put some uh, some obstacles. Part of the human process does progress does have this. Thank you very much. We are 
we are reaching the the, the end of the, the time. I Professor Ben Israel, do you do you hear do you hear hear us? Yeah. No, no, I hear you. Yes. So we are reaching the the, the end of the time. Uh, there were other questions that as uh, uh, we don't have time to answer every question. There is one, uh, Cedric uh, Villani. You, you you already answered uh, with the with the computer. It's about the social impact, especially on job and employment. It's another uh, another fear around AI. So, uh, Professor Villani, you, you, you wrote that uh, it's very hard to say. There are pro and cons. We don't know how many jobs will be created and how many jobs will be destroyed. Um, is it something, uh, Professor Ben Israel, that you, uh, you discussed during the, the, in the framework of the, the work of the strategy, the, how you can uh, mitigate this social impact or, or evaluate them? Yeah, I, yes, of course. I mean, uh, this happens with every new technology. Uh, people, some people lose their work. There, some other people will uh, have new, new types of jobs to to take. And it's all about. Um, but first of all, um, uh, you have to uh, take uh, the government should do something in order to make it smoothly. I mean, not to have crisis, etc. And, uh, but this is, this is uh, uh, the way we live in the 21st century. I mean, every few years there is a new technology and new jobs created and other uh, jobs die. And that's life. It's not so different from any other major technology. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll, I think we'll have to, 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 to Stop the discussion, otherwise we'll uh, continue uh, forever. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I just leave you a final word before before closing, Professor Villani. No, I think that was uh, I was very much. Uh, I, I think this was a lovely exchange and uh, an excellent uh, way for me. You know. I haven't made any international trip for quite a long time, as many people in the world due to the COVID. As you, I used to, as a scientist, I used to travel to 20, 25 countries per year. These, uh, these yeah. international exchanges through Zoom are, of course, not like the real thing, but still some very valuable international exchange, and I appreciate that very much. Thank you. We'll have the opportunity to, uh, to welcome and meet you soon here in Israel and we'll be very pleased to uh, accompany you in your visit. Professor Ben Israel, a final word before, before we close? No, I wish, I wish, wish us all uh, only good health and I miss the days in which I had to go to some 20 countries a year. Uh, I hope we will have it uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much, both of you, for your precious time and uh, for being with us today. Uh, for those who miss uh, part of the of the discussion, you it has been recorded, so you'll be able to watch it over on our website aiandethics.com. And we hope uh, we'll be able to come back soon for the the fourth session of this uh, of this series. Uh, a little bit. Uh, a little bit uh, impacted by the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, so without the possibility of bringing people and experts from France, we'll unfortunately have to continue on Zoom. It's the, uh, it's the, it's the, 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 the terrible, uh, uh, the, the terrible uh, now um, uh, day, daily life for, for most of us. Uh, but I hope uh, we'll uh, we'll meet soon on uh, online then. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Ben Israel and Professor Villani, and I hope you uh, very good time. Thank you. Thank you.